coming up on Foundation for Life with Dr. Waylon Bailey. As important as it is for us to understand that we need to get rid of the physical junk food in our lives, that it is way more important for us to get rid of the spiritual junk food in our lives. It's good to see you. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for those of you who are watching by means of television today. We're excited to have you as a part of our worship this morning. We're talking about godliness. We're talking about learning to think as Jesus thinks. Just think about that. Can there be any goal in life? Can there be anything more significant? Than, than going through that journey. And that's the way it should be seen. It should be seen as a journey because our becoming like Jesus is a process. It's a journey that we are on. And I, wanna, I want you to join with me, and I want to join with you in saying that, that we want to become like Jesus, that we want to know who he is, that we want to think as he thinks. And when that happens, uh, what an what a even more special church it will be. What even more of an experience with God you will have. Sometimes we get kind of afraid, you know, God's going to ask me to do something if I get close to Him. Well, that will be the case. But if you get close to Him and He asks you to do something, it will be a joy and a blessing that is, cannot be measured, cannot be understood on this side of it. So I want to encourage you, let's think about becoming godly people and and let's make it our collective goal that we want to be like Him and that we want to learn of Him. The passage of Scripture that you have to read is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 6. And really, you have to read all of the the chapters of of Paul's letter, first letter to his young protege, Timothy. Because of the 15 times in the New Testament the word godliness is used, nine of them are used in 1 Timothy. And 13 of them are used in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. So it seems that they are clustered right here. So so let's hear what God says to his church, what God says to his people. Paul refers to the things that have happened in the first five verses. There were people who came to lead, who, who sought to lead people into legalism. Legalism is following rules, not rules that come from God, not words that, not commands that come from God, but but rules that are made up by human beings. There were people who came and said they were forbidden to marry. There were people who came and said there are certain foods that are clean and certain foods that are unclean. And Paul said, no, all of God's creation is good and all of God's creation is given for our good. So here's what Paul said to Timothy. If you point these things out to the brothers, what he said in the first five verses, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ, brought up in the truths of the faith and of the good teaching that you have followed. Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. For physical training is of some value, but godliness has a value for all things holding promise for both the present and for the life to come. This is a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. And for this we labor and strive, that we have put our hope in the living God, who is the Savior of all men and especially of those who believe. We have a real problem with junk food. There's a whole body of study about what is the worst junk food. 
And one group from Harvard University says that it's potato chips, that, that of the weight gain that Americans gain every year, the average American gains one pound a year for life. Can you imagine that? That means if you, at 21, if you live from 21 to 71, you're going to live weigh 50 pounds more than you did at 21. I, I'm sorry to say all this stuff, kind of depressing to even think about it. But we're junkies. You know, we drink carbonated beverages, 44, not cans, gallons a year of carbonated beverages. More than bottled water, more than beer. Americans drink 44 gallons of carbonated beverages. We live in a junk food world. And, and we, need, we need to be thinking about this. And here's why we need to be thinking about it, because this is not my body. It's God's body. And because this is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And that's what the Bible tells us. So we need to be thinking about it. We need to be serious about it. We need to be serious about our environment because this is not my world and it's not your world. It's God's world. It's his creation and we ought to treat it with respect and we ought to treat it with kindness. But when we need to think about those things, that's not the point of what Paul is saying. We, we should think about it, but that's not the point. The point that Paul gives is, as important it is, is for us to think about this body that God has given us, which is the temple of the Holy Spirit, as important as it is for us to understand that we need to get rid of the physical junk food in our lives, that it is way more important for us to get rid of the spiritual junk food in our lives. Because that's what Paul is talking about, because it is of some value, he says, for physical training. Paul lived in a world very similar to our day. They had the Olympic Games, and the Olympic Games were as big in the Mediterranean world, maybe bigger than the Olympic Games are in our world, of, in which you can see worldwide what is happening. It was a big event. Paul again and again uses it uses metaphors that come from the Olympic Games. He talks about boxing. He talks about running a race. He talks about running the marathon. Remember, we get the marathon from that early day in which someone ran 26 miles to a city in Greece called Marathon. As someone told me this week, remember that person died. So maybe, maybe, you get my point. It was important for Paul. Physical training is of value, but it's limited value. It's value for 70 years or 80 years or maybe 90 years. But that's the value, and that's all of the value. But spiritual training, is of value for this time, this 70 or 80 or 90 years, and it's also of value for all eternity. Because in reality, what we're doing is that we're getting ready for, for the rest of our life. We're getting ready for the life that is real life. We're getting ready for the life that is to come that we're already experiencing in some sense now, but in a much greater sense in the future. So we have to get off the spiritual junk food. Paul says, point out to the brothers. You will be a good minister if you point out to the brothers the dangers of godless myths and old wives' tales. Because those are the spiritual junk food. It's not the real thing that God has given us. It is the, the counterfeit, or it's the part of it that has a kernel of the truth to it. Think of the prosperity gospel as 
spiritual junk food because there is, a, there is certainly a kernel of truth there because God is a blesser. God is a giver. God wants to bless our lives. I tell people all the time, the best thing you could ever do for yourself is to give yourself to God and to follow God and to love God and to serve God. And the blessings, it will be amazing the blessings that you receive physically, mentally, materially, family-wise. It is amazing the gifts we receive. That's the kernel of truth there. But the prosperity gospel that that God's going to make all of us fabulously rich and that that's the goal of life. That's the junk food. The junk food is that we kind of manipulate God, that the Christian life is, is to manipulate God, that our prayer life is to get what we want. That's the spiritual junk food. God wants us to have the whole thing. He wants us to have the real meat of the word. So we have to get rid of the spiritual junk food. We have to get to the point where we quit taking the shortcuts. Think of how often we do this. We, we take the shortcuts. It, it's the spiritual junk food when we say, you know, I just, I just want to do the minimum I have to do to get to heaven. I always think about, kind of think about that. I always think, what does God think of that? I mean, just think about that. What does God think about that? I, I don't want, really want all of God. I don't want a, really the fullness of God. I don't want really the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit in my life. I just want the minimum I got to have to get to heaven. You got friends like that. And maybe somewhere in our lives we said that. That's the spiritual junk food that is keeping us from the real thing, that's keeping us from the real blessings that God wants us to have, tremendous blessings. So what does God want us to have, and what does God want us to do? Well, here's this passage of Scripture. He wants us to let him nourish our hearts and our minds. This word gymnasia, found in verse 6 and found in verse 7, is used in two different ways. The Greek verb is a complicated verb system. If you think English is, is difficult, you know, trying to get the, conjugate the verbs, and it is, frankly. If English is difficult, Greek is really difficult. But you can say some very precise things in the Greek language. And what he does in verse 6 is he gives a passive verb, and in verse 7 he gives an active verb. That active verb is what you do. It's what you practice, and you train yourself. So that's the active verb. The passive verb is what you let happen to yourself. So he says, and be brought up in the things of God, or be nourished in the things of God. God wants us to be nourished, by himself. He wants us to, to receive everything he wants us to have. We all need to be nourished. We need to be nourished with the great things of God. On your sermon sheet, there's Hebrews chapter 5, verse 14. It's another place where the word gymnasia is used. Paul is talking to people, many of whom who are baby Christians. Now, it doesn't mean that they are new Christians. He just means they're baby Christians. And he says there, you've had plenty of time to grow in your faith and to mature in your faith. And you ought to be eating solid food. You ought to be eating meat. You ought to be eating protein. You ought to be me eating something that is going to, to make you strong. He's using it in a spiritual sense. And he says you need to get off the baby food. I have a brother who's four and a half years younger than I am. And so it was a perfect time. When he was a year old, and maybe six months old, I don't know uh, how they did it back then. But when he was a year old, he got to eat applesauce. 
which I thought was the absolute zenith of desserts. And I didn't know it was just baby food. I no longer, thankfully, no longer think applesauce is the best thing I've ever eaten in the world. And that's what Paul means. It's time to move on. You've been on milk. You've been on baby food. It's time to move on. It's time to move on to maturity. It's time. That's what God wants for you and me. Let's move to maturity. And not just the social maturity that we talk about, but spiritual maturity. So that, that here we are as the people of God and, and that God speaks to us and that we hear His voice and we think like Jesus thinks and we see opportunities for ministry and we do them and we desire to please God and to lift him up and exalt him. Here's what the writer of Hebrews said to the church, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves, gymnasia, have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. So when we are mature, when we are nourished by the Word of God, when we are growing in faith in Christ Jesus, then we are learning to distinguish between good and evil. After all, that's what we want to do, isn't it? We want to get it. We want to understand what matters to God. We want to understand what's significant to Him. And when we get, when we are nourished, when we are dealing with maturity, when we are taking this journey and growing in this journey of becoming like Jesus, thinking as he thinks, having the mind of Christ, when we are training ourselves, then we are getting ready to deal with a world, with a hard world. A lot of children in this worship service, boys and girls, elementary school, middle schoolers, And many of you, you go to school and you look around. And you don't know for sure, but you get the idea you're the only one. I often pray for boys and girls who may be the only person in their class who really wants to live a godly life. Think about teenagers. You, you may go to school and you may look around and you may be wrong, but you, you make a judgment and you, you, you think to yourself, I'm the only one here and that puts us hard. But, but it doesn't matter when you go to work. If you see yourself, I'm the only one who wants to, who, who takes seriously living for God and living a godly life, how hard is that? That's why we need to be nourished with, with what God can give us. That's what Paul says to Timothy, let your heart be nourished. Let your mind be nourished. Let your spirit be nourished by by growing in godliness. Now, there's a way to do this, and it is not complicated. It is spiritual junk food when people say to you, I know the secret of the Christian life. Now, why is that junk food? It's because the Christian life's not a secret. It's been proclaimed from the housetops. It's been, it's been manifested from the cross. It's not a secret. There is not a secret formula here. That spiritual junk food, when people say to you, I know the secret, it's not a secret. Being nourished in heart and mind is not a secret. It is simple stuff. All we're doing is what Jesus did. Now, let's think about it this way. If Jesus needed to be nourished, how much more do you and I need to be nourished? Today, there are three things I look for in prayer. I hope you'll think about these and consider them. There are three things I want to happen when I pray. Number one, I want to meet God. I want to spend time with him. I want to get to know him. 
and I simply want to spend time in his presence. And frankly, since that has become an object of my prayer life, my prayer life, I don't want it to end. And I don't want to measure it in minutes because I want to spend time with God. Second thing that I want to happen in my prayer life is I want to know what matters to God. All of my life, I have prayed telling God what matters to me. But prayer works so much better when we let God tell us what matters to him. And then the third thing that I want to happen in my prayer life is I want to get to the point of doing what matters to God because most of us already know fairly well what matters to God. It's at the point of commitment. It's at the point of dedication. It's at the point of taking a step and making a decision that matters. Jesus was nourished by prayer, and we must be nourished by prayer. And if we're going to make the journey to godliness, we have to be people who pray. But there's something else that Jesus did. Jesus was conversant with the Word of God. For him, the Word of God was the Old Testament. The New Testament, of course, is about him and those people who followed after him. So he didn't have the New Testament as we do, but Jesus knew the Old Testament. Jesus often talked about the Old Testament. When Jesus was baptized, there's a voice from heaven that says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's two verses from the Old Testament put together. God speaks it from heaven, and what does he speak? He speaks what he's already spoken. He speaks the word of God. And we need to be nourished by the word of God. The New Testament writers repeated, they quoted from the Old Testament word over and over again. We need to be nourished by the word. And frankly, if we pray and we don't read the word of God, we're about running at half speed, about half throttle. And it is a dangerous half throttle. And here's the reason why. Because it is easy for us to talk ourselves into things. I've never forgotten. I was in my late 20s, pastor of a church. So I'm a really young guy, really young pastor. And I have a man who comes to talk with me. And there is real turmoil in the family of the worst kind. And I've never forgotten. I can see his face right now. I can see his face right now trying to convince me that he had prayed and that this was the will of God. You see, what we can do in our prayer lives is we can just basically let our will be God's will. But if you read the word of God, you can't have that kind of error in your prayer life. That's why we have to get rid of the spiritual junk food. Take on the meat of the word. And then we understand what matters to God. What did Jesus do? Jesus met with people with people in public. There is something special about public worship. There is something that nourishes so we have to, if we're going to move on to godliness, we have to, let, we have to let God nourish our hearts. But we have to do something else. Not only do we have to, to let God nourish us, but we have to be active. We have to take that word gymnasia and we have to practice it. So we have to practice until we can't get it wrong. I think it was a golfer who gave this definition, the difference between an amateur and a professional. And since I don't know who said it, and since I'm not sure it was a golfer, but since it's Master's Week, let's just assume it was a golfer. And here's what he said. An amateur is is a person who practices until he gets it right. But a professional is a person who practices until he can't get it wrong. I think God wants us to be professionals in that sense, people who train in godliness.
people who go to the spiritual gymnasium and we work out and we give it our best and we don't quit. In verse 9, Paul said, for this reason we toil and strive. There's another Greek word you know because the word for strive is spelled A-G-O-N, agon, and we get the word agony from it, which describes how we feel sometimes when we go to the gymnasium. And that's what Paul said. This is not little, it's not insignificant. It's important. It's powerful in our lives. We want to be like God, and we want to be like God so much that we toil and strive, and we, we agonize over it. We agonize in prayer, and we seek to, to know the Word. Like Paul said to Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman who doesn't need to be ashamed. Well, when would you be ashamed? You'd be ashamed when you stand before God in the judgment. Why didn't you read my Word? Why didn't you study it? Why didn't you meditate on it? Why didn't you memorize it? Why didn't you think about it? Why didn't you agonize over it? God, what does this mean? God wants us to grow in Christ's likeness, to think as he does. And that will only happen when you decide to do that. It will not happen just because you say that's a good thing to do or I came to church or I read the Bible or I prayed. It will happen when you decide, I'm going to do that. That's going to be my life. I'm going to live in this journey. God, I want to think like you think. I want to know who you are. I want to obey you. I want to serve you. And when I go to school tomorrow and I'm the only one, God, I'm going to stand for you. And when I go to work tomorrow and I'm the only one, God, I'm going to stand for you. And when I go home today and I'm the only one, God, I'm going to stand for you. And I'm going to do it in gentleness and kindness and compassion toward my friends and my family. But God, I'm going to stand for you. And let us be those people who are found faithful and who grow in Christ-likeness and who give ourselves unto Him.